Hi everyone, and welcome to Eric's Electronics Workbench. If you follow the projects on this channel, you know I was recently troubleshooting this 100 pound UGC-74B communications terminal built for the US military. These were often used for radio teletype operations. So there's three versions of the UGC-74, the A, B, and C. The A version has a rotary drum printer, and B and C use a dot matrix printer. The problem is that the print carriage didn't move, however, it was not mechanically stuck, although with power applied, it locked into place. So after swapping three boards with a known working UGC-74B, which didn't change the printer problem, and then testing various control signals, the troubleshooting led me to a defective power FET on the carriage motor current control board. The FET was shorted between the gate, source, and drain, essentially keeping one of the phases of the carriage motor turned on and not allowing it to rotate. Now unfortunately, the FET has an obscure military part number. Viewers of the part 1 video mentioned some possible replacements. I also reached out to several component vendors that specialize in mil-spec parts, but the original part number was not available. Oddly, the national stock number, or NSN, for the original FET returns an IRF-230, which is a TO3 device, which is definitely not correct, so I'm not sure why there's that discrepancy. So I've decided to try the IRF-F120. This device has ratings that exceed what will be needed in the circuit, and it's the proper case style, the TO-205AF or TO-39. And keep in mind that this UGC-74 is for my own collection and not something that will be going back into military service, so the repair doesn't need to meet stringent mill specs. The repair is to the best of my abilities, and I'm using what's readily obtainable. Alright, so I'll get the new IRF F120 installed on the board. And I tested this MOSFET with a component tester just to verify that it is in good condition. Now the component is new, but as a general rule, I like to test components before I install them on a board. Now, I also tested the carriage motor windings because I wanted to make sure that there wasn't something wrong with that motor that would have damaged the original FET. So the wiring on this motor comes up the side and it comes over to this connector right here, so I just probed around in that connector. And I just verified that the four phases of that motor have equal resistance on the four phases. There's no shorts between phases, and there's no short circuits from a phase to the chassis. Alright, so I pressed the heat sink onto the new MOSFET. And there's this insulating pad that fits on the bottom of the device and just slips over the leads. So what I'm going to do is just drop this through the holes on the board. Now it's important that the top of this heat sink be level with all the other heat sinks because there's a piece of metal that fits on here and you wouldn't want this heat sink standing up or the device standing up off the board and then tighten everything down. That would put a lot of force into this heat sink and that device and could end up cracking a solder or damaging the device itself. So to make sure that this is sitting down flush to the board, what I'm going to do is just tack one of these leads onto the circuit board with just a little bit of solder, then come back on this side. Using my finger, I'll just squeeze the device down to the circuit board and reheat the joint and make sure that the device does sit all the way down to the circuit board. And then I'll go back and re-solder all three connections. So again, just letting it sit on the surface of the table like this really isn't enough because there's going to be just a little bit of a gap between the circuit board and the device. And you really do need to press it all the way down and make sure that it's flush. So what I will do here is grab my soldering iron. It's going to warm up here. You'll hear a beep. There it goes. All right. And just make sure that you can see this in the camera there. Okay, yep, that just got a little bit of solder on that first lead. That's all it needs right there. So now, I don't know if you can see on the camera, but it is st uh, standing up just a little bit higher than the others. So that's why, see that right there, how that one is standing up just a little bit. So if you were to solder it just like that, you know, you can see it's up just a little bit. That would definitely be a problem. All right, so what I'm going to do is just Hold with my finger, press it down to the board, reheat this connection here. Should 
be good right there. Yep, that went down, looks good there. I'm just squeezing with my finger on the other side. That seems to be down all the way. I'm just going to do this off camera. I'm just looking at it. Yes, that is looking very level across with all the other devices. Perfect. So now what I'm going to do is just make the solder connections on the other leads here. There was some conformal coating on this board, real pain to work with, and it, uh, it's still hanging around these these areas here for the solder, and it kind of gets in the way, but when I desoldered it, it sucked most of it off the board already, but it's just a little bit still here. It's taking the solder. No problems there. Plated through holes, you want to make sure the solder flows down through the, through the hole and around the leads. Make sure that that's visible. Hopefully I'm not blocking that out entirely there. All right, so that should be good to go at this point. And again, if we take a look here, so it's this one right here. You can see when you look along the top right there how they're all level. Make sure it's in focus. So that looks very good. No problems there. So I'll trim those leads, clean the flux off the board, and then let's get this reinstalled in the printer and try it out, see what happens. All right, so let's see if that new MOSFET brings the printer back to life. So like I was doing in the part one video, I have the whole printer mechanism sitting to the side of the UGC-74, but it's turned around backwards, so normally this carriage assembly would be facing out towards the operator. But by turning it around backwards, then the wiring can reach over here back to the motherboard, and it's much easier to do this than to reinstall this entire assembly over in the chassis. There's quite a bit of hardware involved to reinstall it. And then I have these two test leads right here, just joining some wires on the printer to some terminals that are over on this far corner on the power supply. And again, when this is installed, normally these wires would reach directly to those terminals. And I put a piece of paper in the printer just in case it tries to print. All right, here we go. So I'm gonna turn on the outlets on the workbench, right there. And this flex cable that's over here on the printer is part of the power switch. Normally this is towards the front panel and then there's a toggle switch on the front panel that ties into this linkage and it activates the toggle switch that's the actual electrical switch on the back panel on the UGC-74. So I'm just gonna turn that switch on directly and because uh, all of this mechanism isn't hooked up at this point. So let's see what happens. Here we go. Hey, it's working. It's moving. So it starts up here, let's see what happens. How cool is that? So at this point, it should have printed out a message on the paper, it's a initialization startup message, and yes it did. So it's asking for character or line transmission. So if I just tip the keyboard up here, I should be able to type that in. Let's try this here, I'll say, did a line transmission, and then let's see what else. Here it says, automatic line feed with carriage return. I'll just say, try this here. All right, perfect. So now, yep, the terminal is ready to go. You could either start typing text and creating a message, or it could receive information and then begin printing out. Excellent, so if I hit the line feed, yep. 
It's all the way out there. Let's try this. Go. Oh. So there's the printout right there. How cool is that? So let's come back to life. So the next thing that I need to do is to reinstall this printer mechanism back into the chassis. And then I'd like to try the self-test and see if it passes that. And I believe the self-test has the Fox message. So that should exercise the printer and run it through considerably more cycles of printing and just make sure that this carriage mechanism and all the circuitry continues to work properly. All right, so the printer assembly is installed and I don't have any pieces left over, so that's always a good sign. So let's try the self-test and see if this UGC74B is working the way that it's supposed to. Now on the back panel is the data I.O. connector and I have a jumper going from data out back to data in, essentially creating a loop back. And the reason I did that is because I don't want the alarm continuously going off and the line light flashing. If this terminal detects that there's no data coming in or an improper data format coming in, things like that, it will set off an alarm and then the line light will flash. So putting that loop back in place will prevent that from happening. And earlier in the video when I was testing the printer, you may have heard kind of a continuous tone or whining sound, and that was the alarm going off because there wasn't proper data coming in. And now it doesn't care if the data comes from itself or an external machine, you know, just as long as the correct data format is there, it'll prevent that alarm from happening. Now there's two switches right here that are the mode switches for receive and transmit, and they're on the low data setting. Now if they're on the 20 or 60 milliamp loops, then having the loop back in place wouldn't matter. It would still set off the alarm because this machine cannot create a loop current on its own. It has to have an external modem or an external device to create that loop current. So if you have it on the 20 or 60 milliamp loop and there is no loop current, again, the alarm would go off. All right, so I'm gonna reposition the camera so you have a better view looking down into the uh, paper and on the uh, carriage as it goes back and forth here. You can see the printer in action. Now, when I run the self-test, I'll have to close this and do some things on the front panel. And so uh, you know, I'll do that as necessary, but I think it'll be better to have this open and just viewing straight in here because this window right here has some glare to it. And there's actually a very fine mesh inside this glass that prevents uh, interference from going in or out of the machine. And that makes it a little bit hard to photograph you know, with the camera through that for the video. So I think having this open will be better. And when I start the self-test, that switch is back here, but I'll just explain the switches that I'm pushing and what I'm activating to do the self-test. All right, let's try the self-test and see what happens. So I'm gonna turn on the machine just by activating this lever. Normally on the front panel, you would use the power switch, which is a toggle switch right over here. And the back side of this toggle switch links with a kind of a fork shaped mechanism that goes back and forth and it goes onto this lever right here. So. Go. So it'll start up and do the initial uh, message that it prints out. So we'll let it do that. Okay, so character line transmission. Just do. And we'll see. Nope. All right, so at this point, it's ready to, you know, start to use the terminal. You know, you could start typing messages or receiving messages. So I'm gonna reach around to the other side here and hit the start switch for the self-test. Okay. So at this point, you can see on the front panel, these lights are on. And I believe the first thing that we need to do is hit the uh, parity uh, reset button right here. Yep. So. So it does a long line of letter E's and then it prints all the characters. So that's correct, looks good. Now I depress this again. So over here it says memory full and this is gonna take a little bit of time. It's doing a, basically a test of the memory and the processor and other internal circuits. So until this light goes out and you know, some other lights will change on the front panel, we just have to wait so it's busy doing its internal self-test. So this will take a little bit of time. I'm just gonna let the camera run and then uh, I'll probably speed up the video to get through this part a little bit faster, um, depending on how long this actually takes. But uh, I'll let it do its thing here. All 
All right, I'm noticing here that this parity light is on, so let's press this again. All right, so there's the Fox message. So if you take a look in the, in the printer, it's just gonna continuously go with the same message over and over. So it says down in here, the, uh, let me see here. Let, I'm gonna go to another line. There it says the lazy yellow dog was caught by the slow red fox as, as he lay sleeping in the sun. It's a little bit tricky to read because every time there's a space, there's a diamond character. But I believe that's, uh, that's all the words there. Yeah, the, the lazy yellow dog was caught by the slow red fox as he lay sleeping in the sun. So it's gonna go over and over again and just keep printing that. So perfect, the printer is working very well at this point. Not seeing any issues. It looks like it's going through the self-test without any problems. But really happy how this turned out. That, that printer came back to life with just that one that one FET that was defective. Cool, very good, excellent. So yeah, that's that classic Fox message that you often see for testing teletypes and other types of equipment. So now, if I press this again, so this says keyboard test. So what I can do over here is type Yep, no problems as I'm typing on the keyboard. You know, it's responding perfectly, no issues there. So now it says ready. Perfect, so it passed the self-test, no problems. So now the system is initialized, as we can see here, it's gone through that initialization and it's asking again for the character line transmission. So the operator types in those responses and you're ready to go. Very cool. So it looks like it's working the way that it's supposed to, not seeing any issues at all. So really happy how this turned out. So I hope you enjoyed following along on the troubleshooting and repairs of this UGC 74B communications terminal. And if you did, you can let me know by giving the video a thumbs up. And if you're enjoying the content on this channel, don't forget to subscribe because there'll be many more videos coming up in the near future. Lots of projects in the queue and you won't want to miss any of those. All right, as always, thank you for taking time to watch. And until next time, take care. Goodbye for now.